afternoon. Are we ready? Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to another one of our series of music at College Church, thanks to the work of our favorite pianist, Paul Kenyon, and uh, glad to have you here. We'll start with a word of prayer, shall we? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day and for the privilege we have of listening to and enjoying the gifts that you have given one of your servants and some others as well. We pray, Heavenly Father, for this day that you will allow us in listening to music to inspire our soul, feel, feed our soul in Jesus' name. Amen. The uh, concert that will start in a few minutes, uh, Dr. Kenyon has labeled as music in myth and legend. But not to think that Dr. Kenyon is either a myth or a legend, we do need to mention it is his birthday. And sometime earlier this week, his mother called and asked him, why are you going to do this on your birthday? And he said, well, that's just the way I am. And that's the way he is, giving us a gift on his birthday. But at least we can give him at least one gift, can't we? Dr. Jones isn't here to lead this, but here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Paul. Happy birthday to you. And you know the concerts are free, and you know the, the drill. There are baskets at all the exits. So um, on your way out, don't give according to what you think it was worth, because you don't have that much with you. But anyway, enjoy the concert. And Dr. Paul, with music from Myth and Legend. I started doing concerts on my birthday about 30 years ago, and the question was, why do you do this? And I say, why not? <laughs> and I, the other question, you know, well, why do you do this? And Because I still can. So, myth and legend. Um, this is just sort of odds and ends, um, things that I just love to play, and that's pretty much all I ever do. Um, I'm going to begin with some music of Bach. Um, I told Pastor Mark a couple months ago uh, when we were beginning the, the morning prayer in the sanctuary that my, my ritual is to um, talk to the Lord first, and then I talk to Bach most mornings. <laughs> I, I, dead serious. And it's been my habit for many decades. My last teacher when I, you know, well, what do I do to, you know, continue growing? He says, play the well-tempered clavier for the rest of your life. So you get to hear the well-tempered clavier today. Um, Bach, you know, a myth can be something that isn't true. Sometimes there's truth, and then it gets expanded a little bit. His story is remarkable. He um, was a theologian. He taught Latin and rhetoric as just side parts of his job. Um, he composed music for every Sunday of the church year over and over again. Um, but the keyboard music that we slave away to learn so well was not even supposed to be performed the way we do it. They were models of how you're supposed to improvise. He said, you know, so when you play a prelude, do it this way, but it wasn't I, I suppose in the manner of the Lord's Prayer, it's not the exact words we're supposed to say, but do it like this. So I'm going to begin with a prelude in fugue. Um, these, a prelude is sort of a freely structured piece that this one sort of dances. It happens to be in the key of D major, and D major was very meaningful in the, in the 18th century. If you think of the Hallelujah Chorus or Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, those are all D major. They were, it's the key of celebration. Um, so the prelude is, is very dance-like, and then it's followed by a fugue that's very much in the style of a vocal cantata. And the, the keyboard seeks to imitate the idea of 
one voice following on another. And this one is what they call a stretto fugue because he likes to play this game that before one voice finishes saying its bit, the next voice comes in. And so there's overlapping layers of entrances. And um, it's a clever idea. It's really hard to play. <laughs> So anyway, this is the uh, Prelude and Fugue in D major from Well-Tempered Clavier, Book 2.
if I have a, a pantheon of uh, the composers that I think highly of, moving chronologically forward from Bach would be Mozart. And um, almost the polar opposite, where Bach's music can be very cerebral, very thoughtful. Um, Mozart, for all, he, his life was a myth in many ways. He was the, uh, the person that we think of as a child prodigy. He was this boy genius who created perfect music. It seemed like it just came out of his pen fully formed. Uh, didn't have to revise the way mere mortals did. Um, very much a product of the Enlightenment. Everything is sort of um, bright and cheerful most of the time. Uh, although he was, he loved writing for the theater. His operas uh, are, are very vivid dramas that uh, make us laugh, uh, have poignant moments. He wrote very few pieces in minor keys. Um, some of it was just the ethos of the time. He was trying to write with uh, clarity and light and wanted to put all that dark stuff away. Um, being contrary, and I am, um, I'm gonna play two pieces in minor keys. Uh, they're fairly remarkable in that they show Mozart, the improviser. And uh, some of you know I like to improvise a little bit. Um, if Mozart were living now, he probably would have been a jazz musician. Um, and uh, the first of these is called a rondo. And the idea of a rondo is we have a main idea, we do something else, and the main idea comes back. And we do that until we're tired and we stop. Well, Mozart can't leave enough alone. When the main idea comes back, he has to mess with it every time. And so he, the elaborations get more complicated each time. He, they're, they're beautiful. It's, uh, and then he takes us into, in the, the in-between places, he takes us into harmonies that ordinarily don't quite belong there. And there's some surprising places, especially if you know what Mozart's normal is. So that's the Rondo in A minor. And then the fantasy that I'm going to play that follows is also in D minor, but it's a little bit of a misnomer. About halfway through, he gets tired of all this dark stuff and he makes it happy and we've got to have a, a happy ending. Uh, and then he also puts in a bunch of what they call cadenzas, which are sort of show-off places where the, the pianist can be fingery. So you'll hear that. So this is the Rondo in A minor followed by the fantasy in D minor of Mozart.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn our attention forward 100 years or so. And the year is 1899, and a young French composer named Maurice Ravel introduced a piece that was based on an ancient Spanish dance called a pavan. And I'm not going to do a pavan for you. It probably would violate one of the special rules in the manual or something. But um, uh, Ravel was one of the composers that we generally put in the category of the Impressionists. Um, think Monet and Degas and uh, p painters of that time. That they liked their their objects to be sort of hazy and very colorful. Um, the Pavan had an interesting title. Uh, I won't murder the French with Russ in the room. Um, it roughly translates um, Pavan for a dead princess. And um, sounds rather morbid. And uh, the title is, but the music is not. It's um, has some poignant moments, but it really doesn't sound funereal. It's um, just a beautiful, it, and it happens to be one of the pieces that orchestras like to, prom to play. Ravel had this habit of, of writing things for the piano and then turning them into orchestra pieces. And so you will hear this played often at Symphony Hall, and uh, it's, it's one of the, the, the pieces that shows up often on concert programs. I'm gonna follow that with a piece that was written soon after that, in the early 1900s, um, was completed around 1901, but published in 1905. And this is uh, another sort of imaginary world. Um, he took his inspiration from uh, the, the poet Apollinaire, and the title is Je Do, or the play of waters. And um, you can hear it in the way the piano is treated I get to a lot, do a lot of watery things at the piano. So this is the Pavan and the Jado.
going to finish the program today uh, with some music of Franz Liszt. Um, I just re realized I should say a word about next month's program. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's April 23rd. Russ is shaking his head yes, so that must be right. Uh, we are going to bring back a program. We're going to do different music, but the people that I played with last April, uh, we called that program some strings attached, uh, Jazz in the Sanctuary, uh, Freddie Franken and uh, Andre Gonzalez who are going to do a uh, little bit of jazz for you. Um, and uh, they make me sound pretty good when they're here, so uh, you'll enjoy that. Um, and yes, as, as Russ mentioned, we have baskets to take all your money. Um, I, I, I say it too often, but uh, the concerts are free, but they're not cheap, and uh, we appreciate the support. It's great to have you all here. Um, I, I say it all the time. I love making music in this room. I love playing this piano, and uh, it's much more fun when you show up, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Liszt was a Hungarian composer, um, was born in 1811, but lived a long time really almost made it to the 20th century. And um, throughout his lifetime and much of the history since, people have considered him to be the greatest pianist of all time. Um, he was sort of a, a barnstormer. He, could, he, he was a rock star of the 1800s. Uh, uh, the women would swoon and uh, you know, he'd throw off his gloves and it would be like Michael Jackson or something like that. It's hard to imagine um, a cult figure, but um, it's interesting, later in life, um, he got very interested in spiritual things. And he wrote quite a bit of piano music, orchestra music, uh, a couple oratorios that were based on biblical themes or sacred themes. And the two legends that I'm going to play for you are about lives of saints. And so, um, I love them because they're very picturesque. You will, just like the, the jeu d'eau, you could hear the water, right? We get more water, but be, first we get birds. Um, uh, the first of the legends is St. Francis of Assisi preaching to the birds. So we get birds everywhere. And then you get the prophetic word of the preaching. And then um, we get the two interspersed. And uh, it's just incredible writing for the piano and uh, a lot of fun to play. Uh, the second one is based on a character that's not as familiar to us, uh, St. Francis de Paul. Um, apparently, and this, is, this has got to be in the area of legend. I do not vouch for the story to be true, but it's a great story. Uh, apparently, he was one of the, the monks that had pledged himself to poverty, and he was making his way through the countryside, and then came to a, a stream that required a boat to get across. And there was, the boatman there required a toll. Um, and I won't remember what the, the toll was, but whatever it was, it was more than the, the dear saint could pull out of his pocket. And um, so these, these guys running the, running the, the, the boat to get across, said, well, if you're, if you're so holy, why don't you just walk across? Well, he did. And um, List, in his imagination, imagined, you know, I, would, I envision this stream as just not being that far across, but somehow we got some storm in the middle of this. So, I mean, you know, the, the, when Jesus calmed the storm and the disciples were scared, this has, th that is nothing on this story, okay? <laughs> uh, so, List liked to write storm music, so you'll hear it. And then there's this, this triumphant, you can tell at the ending, um, he gets across into safety. So, um, fear not, okay? <laughs> so anyway, this is St. Francis preaching to the birds and St. Francis de Paul walking on the waves. <laughs> 